we are just, well, we're starting with the governor's race. And this morning, he has been a candidate for a while. Question is, are people paying attention to the field for the corner office just yet? There are plenty of issues to talk about out there, but let's get things started with Colin Van Ostern. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Ostern or Ostern? Uh, it's Van Ostern, but, I, you know, to be honest, I don't even notice the difference, really? to be honest, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we just get, came through a primary. You've been in the field now for a while. How's the energy? Are people willing to listen at this point and having a hard time getting through? You know, I've found that community leaders around New Hampshire are really engaged. Uh, I think a lot of voters have been distracted by the presidential campaign. Yeah. It's kind of like a driving by a car accident. You don't want to watch, but, you, you know, you still have to look. Um, but the truth is we've found extraordinary grassroots support. Most of the mayors of our largest cities at this point have endorsed our campaign. Um, 80 Demo more than 80 Democrats in the state legislature have as well. Um, and this is somewhat unique given the presidential primary. Most of both Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton's grassroots leadership teams in the state have endorsed me. Um, and we're really proud of the grassroots network that we're building, mainly because this is a small state where individuals and relationships matter a lot and uh, that's going to be what propels us forward you not can't just put in, in the, the same room together at least not right now <laughs> well so. you know it's good that people have something to be united about um, and i actually i think the issues that are at stake are important enough that folks know we take having a good governor for granted sometimes in new hampshire because we've had some pretty good governors for the last 18 the last 20 years um, but we also know that we have a drug crisis that we're facing. Uh, it's great that unemployment is low, but we need to continue to grow our economy, grow population, bring and keep young people and young families and new businesses here. Yeah, let's talk, talk about the drug crisis. Still number one issue in the minds of voters by far. It's not even close here in New Hampshire. Uh, we know what the governor has done with her council. I mean, and a lot of people are, are working hard on this. Is there any approach that you would take that's any different? Do you have any ideas what you would do that maybe, hey, you know, this, this might work? Well, you know, part of what I've done thus far is try to urge immediacy, as the governor has. Um, I actually raised the idea of calling the legislature into a special session, which the governor and the council ultimately did this past fall. I think waiting isn't an option when people are dying every single day. I talked to a woman last week at the governor's summit on substance abuse. Who's, she has a 24-year-old son who is addicted to heroin and in Cheshire County Jail right now. Uh, she cannot wait for us to you know, take our time to deal with this. It's an emergency. Sure. Uh, and so I'm glad about some of the things that have happened, higher penalties for fentanyl, a statewide drug court system that's moving forward, a stronger prescription drug monitoring system. Just this week, we authorized an investigation to figure out if prescription drug companies are committing fraud in the way they're marketing Have some you, of these painkillers. I mean, that's a question I want to ask you about. Yeah. Is that, do you believe that the uh, pharmaceutical companies are engaging in, in, in some sort of shady practices when it comes yeah. to this. I mean, listen, it, it, they're, they're drug companies, you know, they made, they made medicine, they're not new medicines, um, but now that we have this problem, uh, why go after the makers when initially it was the doctors? And then there's some personal responsibility here as well. Uh, well, there's no question there's no one silver bullet uh, to solve this, but we also need to be taking every possible approach. Our state is swimming in prescription drugs and prescription painkillers. Four out of five folks who are addicted to heroin or fentanyl start on prescription painkillers. And there is, in fact, evidence. This is why we have to investigate it. And if we find that there's a reason to bring a lawsuit, we as a state should. But there's evidence that, for example, um, one drug maker was marketing its pills as good for 12 hours when they knew that it wasn't. Uh, and the reality is that when you do that, doctors are forced in to start prescribing higher and higher doses, which gets people addicted more and more. Uh, there was a huge expose about that, about the maker of OxyContin. In the state of New York, they've actually settled the lawsuit with one drug maker, which means, you know, technically the drug maker didn't uh, admit they were doing something wrong, but they started taking corrective action. Sure. I don't care about blame, I care about solutions. And just starting this lawsuit clearly and publicly like this puts the drug makers on notice that they know they need to be treating this just as carefully as everyone else is now in the state. But overall, the approach the governor is taking right now, uh, you're satisfied? I right? think it's been in exactly the right direction. I think we've needed to do more. I've been frustrated sometimes that the legislature is dragging their feet or saying, oh, we need to figure out where the money comes from, when in fact, when you're dealing with an emergency and people are dying every day, you have to have an immediacy around it, and that's what I've been trying to focus I was on. The legislature, though, just recently criticized the governor. She, she's obviously in the Senate race for not being as engaged as she was back before the budget was passed when it came to uh, getting some of these dollars applied. 
You know, I've always found this governor to be very engaged, and I can tell you that in the discussions that we've been having about this drug crisis, uh, not just in recent months, but over the course of the past year, uh, I've been impressed that there have been leaders, not just Democrats, but Democrats and Republicans who have come together to work on this. I think the governor's been part of that. I think all of us acknowledge that we need to do more and we need to do it faster. Um, I, I heard a great analogy by someone I was at a forum for uh, these issues last summer, and there was an individual who's in long-term recovery. And they said, first you go through denial when you're addicted. Uh, and then to really get clean, you have to be surrounded by support. It's not one magic thing that gets you better. Well, we are past being in denial in the state, and we now need to surround this problem by support. I think that's what we're doing, but we just need to move faster. Let's talk about education, higher education. I mean, here in New Hampshire, costs a bundle. You leave school unless you have wealthy parents, you're likely pretty good debt. I mean, is there realistically a way to bring down the cost of college? There is. Yeah. Um, so I have personal professional experience in this. I helped launch a college at Southern New Hampshire University called College for America. It's a nonprofit um, dedicated to the idea that students can get a degree without going into debt. Uh, this year, in fact, when I started, it was just a few years ago, we had no paying students at the time, a dozen employees. This year we will enroll uh, as many new students as UNH and Dartmouth combined. The vast majority are getting a degree with no debt. Most are the first in their family to go to college. Accredited? Just got to ask. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, Southern New Hampshire University, well-respected, accredited oh, degree. Oh, it's through. Uh, it's yeah, absolutely. Through and, and in fact, uh, also, by the way, the fastest growing large employer in the state of New Hampshire because of some of the innovative things that we've been yeah, doing Yeah, the college there. is booming. But UNH, I mean, the universe, university yeah. system as a whole, you know, I mean, there's, there's tuition freeze, I believe, still in place. We had yeah. a tuition freeze for four years for the first time in 25, right. which was a start, but when you're the highest tuition in the country, freezing it isn't enough. <laughs> you got to do more than that. Um, I think that we need to bring our university system and our community college system closer together, link them more directly with employers than we do right now. One of the successes that we built at College for America is that when you realize that employers benefit from someone getting a degree just as much as the student, and you directly engage with them and build programs with them, yep. you can unlock a lot of value, find other people who will pay part of the costs and keep costs lower because of that. What, what, about, what about the economy? I mean, we point to it was second best in the nation when it comes to unemployment. If it's not broke, yeah. don't fix it. I mean, we've come it, along pretty good. It, it's extraordinarily good that our employment is our unemployment is as low as it is, but there's also a danger. H having worked at big, fast-growing employers, I can tell you uh, it, we have to do everything we can to grow our talent pool it, so that a uh, fast-growing employer can grow faster. Uh, one of the reasons I've been an advocate for passenger rail and bringing down the cost of college is because if we can do more to bring and keep young people and young families here, uh, we will succeed and grow more. A lot of people confuse economic growth with unemployment. It's good that unemployment's low. We want economic growth to be high as well. They don't just go hand in hand. You have to make sure that we're growing good, good paying jobs in our state. Yeah, what about rail? Uh, I, you know, obviously I've been one of the big champions for this for years. It's one of the reasons I ran for executive council. When I ran, we got that uh, famous capital corridor rail study done, which shows that it would create 5,600 new jobs. Um, that people is- People ride. Are you convinced people would ride? Well, I'm convinced that the business owner who went from 10 to 15 employees last summer, who every time I see him, he says, we need to grow faster. How can I tap into a bigger talent pool? Why can you guys not get your act together and conquer to get passenger rail done? Uh, I'm convinced that he knows his business is at stake. It's not abstract or ideological to him. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time and effort studying this, uh, we need to take the next step forward. It, dozens of Republicans voted for this in the House. Uh, the Chambers of Commerce of our two biggest cities in the state, which are pretty conservative, are in favor of it. Uh, a lot of Democrats like me have been not just talking about it, but in the trenches making progress on it. It's time for us to move forward. We've got to build a brighter future for our state. When you asked me, we have less than two minutes to go. It's not really an issue here in New Hampshire yet. Nationally, everybody's talking about it, and it could uh, come here, and that's the uh, transgender bathroom bill. Yeah. I mean, so what's your take on this? Well, I am proud that New Hampshire is a place that has celebrated equality and inclusiveness. Um, part of the way I look at it because of the work I've spent in the private sector as I look at this is you see what happened in North Carolina. They passed that bill that basically enables discrimination. And the next day, PayPal, which was supposed to grow 400 new jobs in that state, decided they were going to move somewhere else because their employees didn't want to be moving or relocating to a place that authorized discrimination. We were one of the first states in the country to make marriage equality happen here. I have talked this, this to is a little bit different. I mean, you, I mean, you, you're talking about a father, and I'm just from the opponent's a father worried about you know a man walking into the bathroom where his daughter is. I mean, that's yeah. that's what that's what some people are concerned about, uh, and the opponents. 
Is this a state's issue, though? I mean, you had the president make his decision uh, kind of unilaterally. That rankled some people, though. But should it be left up for the, to the states? I think discrimination is wrong, whether it happens at the state level or the federal level. I think equality, respect, and inclusiveness are core New Hampshire values. I will fight to protect them in our state. Uh, I think, frankly, New Hampshire generally operates that way now. I think most folks know that we're a place that celebrates inclusiveness, and that's good, and we should not be taking these, these tax that some of these other states have been doing to discriminate against our fellow citizens. Yeah, hopefully everybody can just work it out and get along, right? <laughs> well, that's true on many issues. Best of luck to you moving forward. We're out of time on this segment. We'll have you back, though, soon. Thanks for having me back, John. Good to see you.